Welcome to everybody listening in. My name is Philip Nicholas, and I'm joined today in conversation with Professor Anton Friedrich Koch, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Heidelberg. His fields of interest include classical Greek metaphysics, German idealism, and contemporary philosophy. He is the author of Wahrheit, Zeit und Freiheit, Einführung in eine philosophische Theorie, Die Evolution des logischen Raumes, Aufsätze zu Hegel's Nicht-Standard-Metaphysik and, most recently, Hermeneutischer Realismus. Hello, Professor. How are you doing today? Well, thank you. I'm fine. And I hope you are too. <laughs> I would like to start things off with a question about the present. We're currently living through strange times, perhaps times of crisis. Before the pandemic, we saw uprisings in Chile, Hong Kong, the Yellow Vests in Paris, some of which are still very much ongoing. Then the pandemic itself has visited and still visits tragedy and challenge upon many, and it has made its mark everywhere in society. And now just recently, following the murder of George Floyd, massive anti-racism protests have erupted in the US, but also here in Europe. What in Hegel's philosophy do you think can offer us ways to better understand these events? Well, um, difficult question. These events are quite different, and apart from the pandemic, which has in fact created a new situation worldwide, they are qua tokens of their respective types all familiar. We have been seeing uprisings in Latin America and Hong Kong and political protests in France and other European countries for years, if not for decades. And anti-racism protests in the US almost for centuries. So as far as Chile, France and the US are concerned, these are Western capitalist societies, while China is a somewhat different case with an authoritarian one-party capitalism. So let me put China and the pandemic, which incidentally happened to start there, to one side. As regards Western capitalism, Hegel has interesting things to say in his philosophy objective of objective spirit, also known as his philosophy of right. Civil society, he sees and says, produces immense wealth and at the same time extreme poverty due to its very structure. Marx agreed with this diagnosis, but offered a kind of cure that we now know does not work, and is rather a nightmare. The rule of one party and the socialization of the means of production. Hegel instead assigned a mitigating role to the state. The state ought to ensure that the excesses of extreme poverty and of extreme wealth that could threaten the sovereignty of the state and democracy do not arise. Otherwise, populism, that is, an unholy alliance of poor and rich rabble, will threaten to overthrow democracy and legal security. Until 1989, when the Soviet Empire collapsed under the impact of Czech, Slovakian, Polish, East German and, uh, what was decisive in the end, Russian yearning for freedom. And of course, under the effects of the desolate state of the uh, economies in Central and Eastern Europe and Russia, until that time, capitalism, above all in the frontline states here in Western and Northern Europe, was under a certain pressure to prove its superiority, even for the working class. This pressure faded together with the Soviet Empire. And since then, Western capitalism has been increasingly shameless, insolent. As a result, many Western societies have become become susceptible to populism. And we see the rule of the rich rabble in some countries, for example, of the American double continent, and of course, in the so-called social media, which are controlled by powerful private firms and which should perhaps better be labeled anti-social media. China, 
with its authoritarian, control-addicted, one-party state capitalism and its constantly growing economic power is another threat to democracy and to the rule of law worldwide. The cure would be to strengthen democratic structures and legal security in the states around the world. And Hegel's philosophy of right could provide inspiration for this. But whether it will come to that is uncertain and, I fear, rather doubtful indeed. As far as racism is concerned, in many European countries we have serious forms of xenophobia which lead have led lead to biased and aggressive actions not only by racist individuals and groups, but even in the state bodies such as the police. We have a historically different kind of racism in those countries where capitalism included slavery. The late effects of slavery are still clearly felt even in an overall democratic and very rich society like the US American one. The privatization of the education system through expensive pay schools and pay universities is, I believe, the inhumane basis, basic evil here, that a constitutional state would have to abolish. Another basic evil is the total privatization of the health system. Don't let them in, chant European racists for fear of immigrants from other continents. But the American slaves were kidnapped by Europeans in Africa centuries ago and forcibly taken to the Americas against their will. They and their descendants have lived there much longer now than many European Americans and their ancestors, such as, just for example, the current president with his Palatine grandparents and his Scottish mother. If monuments to southern leaders like Robert E. Lee are now being raised to the ground, that is a bit dishonest and hypocritical. You would have to grind the monuments of all slave owners, such as, for example, George Washington, to express that you want justice for American Ameri African Americans. So one ought to tear down the monuments to the founding fathers of the United States. What America needs are completely new constitutional foundations, for the present ones were devised and enacted by white European slaveholders. France has its fifth republic by now, so why shouldn't America establish its second union? And a look at Hegel's philosophy of right could be helpful in this, of course, very, very counterfactual process. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, this reminds me of the practice in philosophy, particularly first philosophy, where foundational tenets and principles are continually taken up and revised. Very rarely, if ever, do we see new philosophies coming on the scene that do not critique, modify, or replace the foundations. I find in particular Hegel's system to be sensitive to this, where premises and results aren't divorced from their development, but are, rather, presupposed by a certain evolution, or, as Wittgenstein could put it, reflect a certain form of life. All this to say, constitutions and nations are themselves products of history, but often we see these finite products raised to infinite importance or ultimate concern. But it's exactly this fixity which, as Hegel writes in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, is slowly chipped away by an indeterminate presentiment of what is yet unknown. And the example he uses there is that of a child being born. However, perhaps the most pressing concern looming in the background is that of the climate crisis. The social theorist Murray Bookchin has said, in a very Hegelian way, that one does not change the relationship between people and nature without primarily changing the relationship of people to people. That is, as long as structures of domination exist between human beings, where human beings are rendered mere instruments, marketable objects and commodities, then human beings cannot help but dominate nature. Hegel had devised very particular logics with regards to the natural world and the world of human beings. 
but one where the human realm is fundamentally characterized as a liberation in a special Hegelian relation of being at home with oneself and one's other. And one can here think of a few examples from his philosophy of spirit. Quote, what we have said already implies that the transition of nature to spirit is not a transition to an out and out other, but is only a coming to itself of spirit that is outside of itself in nature. End of quote. And another passage reads, quote, In the absolute truth of this liberation, the three, three stages, finding a world before it as a presupposed world, generating a world as posited by itself, and gaining freedom in it, from it and in it, are one and the same. End of quote. Do you think Hegel's way of thinking about nature spirit can shed light on the situation regarding climate justice? Or do you think contemporary society has reached a point where this relation of liberation is irretrievably obscured, such that this problem has simply evolved beyond the scope of Hegel's philosophy? Well, with Hegel I believe, and by the way I think I can prove it independently of Hegel's philosophy and system, that space and time as the general matrix of nature on the one hand and embodied human-like subjectivity on the other hand are logically entangled. I call this the subjectivity thesis. In other words, there can be no space-time system if it does not, sooner or later, here or there, produce some spatio-temporal perceiving and thinking subjects within it. And there can be no perceiving and thinking subjectivity if it is not embodied in space and time. So bad news for naturalism and for theism. <laughs> uh, so nature and spirit are not, are not completely foreign to each other. On the contrary, they are, as I have just tried to express it, logically entangled. This entails, as you have indicated, that our relationship to nature varies with our relationship to each other. But, as the later Heidegger saw, more clearly than Hegel, we are neither masters of our interpersonal relationships nor of our relationship with nature. A democratically legitimized world government does not exist, cannot exist and should not exist. It would be a nightmare for even the most democratic state realizes freedom only in such a way that it simultaneously limits and threatens freedom. Therefore, there ought to be many states and the possibility of immigration. So what we have are only competing capitalist societies and states with conflicting interests. And I believe that this situation is permanent. Mm. Hegel overestimates human possibilities just as much as contemporary reductionist materialism and scientism does, albeit in a completely different way. But both parties have fallen victim to the myth of transparency in their very different ways, as if the real could be investigated and then known through and through and be transformed according to a plan a master plan. But if things get better, it is not because of human wisdom and freedom. They have been getting better and better since the days of colonialism and slavery. People around the world are living longer than before. They are more educated than before. They are less hungry and suffer less from disease and pain. But there is no human plan behind it, no world spirit either. It is just the way it is, and we should be grateful for it. But even though, as you say, the real could not be investigated and transformed, maybe there is no um, plan that we can make about these activities. No master plan, at least. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but could we? Um, but there, that doesn't mean there is no rationality to our structures or like the, our activities, well, such that we can. Well, maybe so, or. I think Hegel believes there is hmm. some kind of rationality. Hmm. So the process of the evolution of space and time, physical space and time, which at some point 
by necessity has to lead to embodied subjectivity is there to continue and to continue and embodied subjectivity in that very process will hopefully realize freedom more and more. Yeah. So there is an imminent tendency, yeah. but still it's always open to surprises, mm -hmm. even terrible ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like take a very educated, civilized society which then turns to national socialism and kills six million Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. My next question concerns the position of Hegel's philosophy in relation to contemporary philosophy more generally. What is the importance of Hegelian studies in current philosophy and culture? Here I would like to ask both about the situation worldwide and, which I expect you know fairly better, the situation in Germany. After the great philosophical projects of Sellers, Quine, Davidson, Strawson and others in the second half of the 20th century, analytic philosophy, world philosophy, has entered, it seems to be, a phase of neo-scholasticism. Isolated questions are discussed without prior investigation of whether and to what extent they are genuinely philosophical at all, and without contextual philosophical knowledge. Older theories are ignored, not refuted, and a general blindness to what philosophy really is, is growing. This is largely due to structural features of the academic labor market and the growing number of professional philosophers worldwide. They all try to find their specific niches in what they in niches that they can excel, if at all. Uh, philosophical research, however, is holistic and does not function like research in the life sciences where a particular laboratory may be hunting a particular virus. When we now look back on Hegel, we find, firstly, that his philosophy is indeed holistic, more so than the philosophy of any other philosopher in the history of Western philosophy. Secondly, and no less importantly, we find that Hegel's encyclopedic system is based on his logic, that is, on the presuppositionless basic theory of thinking and being that gives unity to the philosophical thought. This could serve as a paradigm for what is really our task as academic philosophers everywhere in the world and also here in Germany where the situation is as deplorable as elsewhere. Do you think this lack of holistic thinking and general blindness makes philosophy and philosophers more susceptible to pressures of markets, governments and other external elements? As you say, becoming particular laboratories for particular predefined problems. What I have in mind here is whether the deplorable condition is due specifically to the contents of philosophical activity, what we are studying, what we're talking about, or whether that activity itself, in its form, is curtailed by the contemporary academia. Yes, you're right. I should have stressed from the outset that the deplorable situation is ultimately due to, as you put it, pressures of markets, governments and other external elements. Capitalism, at least in continental Europe, had always made stops before the universities. In recent decades, it has knocked vigorously at our doors. Well, but more like special forces knocking <laughs> on the doors of suspected terrorists. For centuries, competition between universities and individual researchers had been informal and subject to purely qualitative standards. Now it is being formalized according to quantitative standards, leading to absurd forms of behavior by members of the former academic republic. Again, Hegelian theory of objective spirit would be an antidote, but strong interests of unauthorized groups are powerfully opposed to this in Europe and around the world. 
I would like to ask you a more technical question. In your book, Die Evolution des Logischen Raumes, you ask the question, how can the entire logical space have its free existence and determinate being in individual personality? Would you be able to give a sketch of Hegel's answer to this problem? But perhaps first, for those unfamiliar, could you briefly explain what is meant by logical space and why it evolves? Well, metaphysics is the theory, or if you prefer, the, on the topology of logical space. And logical space is the totality of what can be the case and can be thought. Standard metaphysical theories give us static images of logical space. <clears throat> logical space is, well, the homogeneous sphere of being, Parmenides, the cosmos of forms, Plato, the infinite substance, Spinoza, the set of all possible worlds, David Lewis, and so on. In contrast, Hegel's non-standard metaphysics is an evolutionary theory of logical space. Logical evolution is what the Hegel scholar MacTaggart may have envisioned as the C series of events underlying all temporal phenomena, the A and the B series of events. The scale of the C series is logical time, or better said, the logical basis of physical time. Likewise, logical space is the logical basis of physical space. You could call logical space the absolute, with Hegel. But Hegel says that some stages in logical evolution drop out as predicates of the absolute, namely the finite ones, like something and the other, boundary and limit, and the finite as such. So the concept of logical space is broader, more neutral than that of the absolute. Logical space may appear finite at certain stages of its evolution. The absolute may not. That is why I prefer logical space over the absolute. Now, at the beginning of the logic of the concept, logical space takes the form of the concept as such, with its three essential moments, the universal, the particular, and the individual. The corresponding standard metaphysics would probably be that of Plato, who conceives logical space as the cosmos of forms, which the philosopher has to analyze by dehiresis, that is, by means of conceptual divisions. In Hegel's evolutionary theory of logical space, the ontology of forms gives way to an ontology of facts, according to which all things are a judgment, that is, have propositional form, like facts. If this is the negative or critical lesson about the concept, as it appears initially, the logic. The positive one is that the concept is the logical basis of transcendental self-consciousness or Kantian apperception expressed in the I think. In the transparency of the concept or self-consciousness, thinking and being are identical. Self-consciousness, by its very nature, is what it thinks it is. Logical space has thus, at this stage, left behind the opacity of substance and the blindness of necessity and has become completely transparent to itself and free. But the concept qua logical space is but the logical basis of real self-consciousness in space and time, that is, the self-consciousness of real finite persons. So here we get a kind of Christmas equation. Den aller Weltkreis nie beschloss, der liegt in Marienschoß, as Luther rhymed in one of his Christmas chorales. That means he whom the whole world never encompassed is identical to the one who lies in the womb or lap of Mary. This is the special Christmas equation, meant to apply only to one finite person, Jesus of Nazareth. But Meister Eckhart 
applied the equation widely <clears throat> in his heterodoxy, since according to him, we're all brothers and sisters of the first-born Son of God, and are therefore in the deepest depths of our souls just as identical with God as Jesus is. This leads to the general Christmas equation that Eckhart shares with Hegel. Every human being is identical with God, or philosophically expressed with logical space. Identical, of course, in a certain speculative way, not easy to spell out. Here, Hegel falls prey, it seems to me, to his own triumphant transparentism. Within the opacity of substance, we might settle for an opaque identity, opaque identity, I think, of persons and logical space, <clears throat> opaque like that in quantum mechanics of wave and particle. But within the transparency of the concept, the inconsistency of our, different, uh, of our difference from each other and from logical space on the one hand, and our identity with each other and with logical space on the other, becomes posited, gesetzt, that is made explicit and is thus incurable. But this is Hegel's problem, not that of someone like me, who is a fan of hermeneutic opacity and uh, of the indeterminacy of translation and interpretation. Now I would like to turn to more personal matters and ask you about your own life and journey to Hegel. How did you first encounter Hegel? And what is of enduring interest to you personally in Hegel's philosophy? Mm, yeah, long ago. Yeah. <laughs> At the gymnasium I had been reading Nietzsche and Wilhelm Reich, also Schopenhauer, Hegel's lifelong deadly foe, just to quote a song by Bob Dylan about Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> he did ten, did 10 years in Attica reading Nietzsche and Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich. <laughs> okay, um, and of course I had been reading Marx, who often enough critically referred back to Hegel, critically and yet also appreciatively. And waiting behind Hegel were Fichte and Kant, and far behind, or rather at the very beginning of Western philosophy, Aristotle and Plato. So I knew what was in and what was in store for me when I began to study philosophy. Fortunately, I already knew German, but I still had to study classical Greek. And I did that in my first semesters. Yet I also ran into a seminar on Hegel in my very first semester or rather on Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy of the state. But we began by reading passages of Hegel's philosophy of right for some weeks. Back then in the German university system, you could find students of all semesters, first year students like me and doctoral students in one seminar. You all felt like young scientists, scholars and intellectuals. As soon as we had passed the gymnasium, this particular type of German high school that had given us the university entrance qualification. So I sat in the classroom among Hegel experts, mostly with Marxist proclivities, who discussed a lot, and I did not understand a word. <laughs> After a while it dawned on me that the usual way to get to well, get expertise and gain expertise in Hegel was to have oneself drilled through constant training constant expert gossip, constant reading and rehearsing, to speak that particular Hegel-like jargon. But I have been a lazy guy all my life. Such lengthy training would have been too strenuous for me. In philosophy, as in all other theoretical fields, I always looked for the shortcut through understanding. But unfortunately, in Hegel's case, I did not see where I could have found that shortcut. So I gave up on Hegel, at least for the time being. I decided that there were other things to study first. Predicate logic and Kant, for example, then Quine and Sellers, Strauss and Davidson. But I knew and felt that something very important was missing. Those analytic philosophers, interesting and instructive as they were, stopped asking questions far too early, according to my lights. 
Kant and Hegel went further, and Hegel even further than Kant, in their philosophical investigations. That is, in their way of asking and trying to answer questions about the deep structure of thinking and being. So I knew that I had to return to Hegel sooner or later. In fact, it turned out to be later, and almost too late. Over the years, I had written my doctoral thesis on Kant and Sellers, and had got a job as an assistant or lecturer at the University of Munich, thus giving seminars myself in the 1980s. A colleague of mine, whose philosophical competence I greatly admired, he has died just some weeks ago, Hans-Peter Falk, had written his doctoral thesis on Hegel's logic and had discussed it against the Kantian and an analytic background. His main idea was that Hegel had tried in his logic to devise a strictly presuppositionless theory. That struck me as a revelation. I decided to give a seminar on the beginning of the logic myself as soon as possible, saying to myself, if Hegel really starts without presuppositions, then I need not to know anything about his or anyone else's philosophy in order to understand the beginning of the logic. And this finally worked out. Step by step in the following years, I worked my way into Hegel's presuppositionist logical theory. My enduring interest in this theory is that it really starts from scratch, laying bare much of the deep structure of thinking and of being, and the intimate relationship between both. In the event, however, it deviates from the truth, from the truth, or so it seems to me. But that's another story to do with Hegel's transparentism and a long and winding one at that. Hegel is a notoriously difficult thinker, as you yourself has, had, um, has um, just told us about your um, looking for a shortcut and understanding and finding it practically impossible. Besides the language being expressly demanding, the ideas themselves are unforgivingly difficult. What would be your advice to newcomers to Hegel's thought? Hmm. In, in German, as presumably also in Dutch and in the Scandinavian languages, um, philosophical terminology is closer to the vernacular than in English, namely much less of a Latin character. So Hegel's language, in a narrow sense of language, is not particularly demanding neither his vocabulary nor his syntax. But his ideas are indeed, as you say, unforgivingly difficult. Reading Hegel, I had the strange impression that the meanings of common German words in sentences with a rather clear syntax were nevertheless completely beyond my intellectual capacities. And I couldn't even say why. The inferential connections between Hegel's sentences seemed to be completely alien and enigmatic, like Martian thinking in familiar German wording. My advice for newcomers is to set themselves the task of trying to devise the completely presuppositionless theory on their own and to compare their successive findings with the beginning and then the continuation of Hegel's logic. And when I say presuppositionless, I mean presuppositionless in all relevant respects. So, do not presuppose any doctrine, any terminology, any method, or even a specific subject matter for pure thinking. That is for the presuppositionless logic. The logic has to find all this for itself in its due logical evolution. And it will then turn out to be a theory of thinking and being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you were to list uh, the top three most helpful books that have helped your own understanding of Hegel, which would you mention? Uh, yeah, there are many great books on Hegel, and many of them from admirable colleagues and good friends, books 
that have deepened and refined my understanding of Hegel. But at the beginning of my Hegelian studies in the 1980s, I was completely on my own, because as a beginner, I would not have, not have understood books about Hegel any better than Hegel himself. At that time, I learned from Michael Toynissen's book Sein und Schein at least that much, that logic is, among other things, a systematic and critical exposition of metaphysics and its history. From Hans-Peter Falk's book Das Wissen in Hegel's Wissenschaft der Logik, I learned that the logic is, above all else, the singular presuppositionist theory, and only then, as a result, the critical systematic exposition of the evolution of metaphysics. That is what helped me most. Finally, from Peter Axel's textbook, Non-Well-Founded Sets, in which Hegel is, of course, not mentioned with a word, <laughs> I learned that in set theory, which is by no means speculative or dialectical, but strictly mathematical, it is possible to deal constructively with non-well-founded structures such as the unit set of itself. So why not also in logic, Hegelian logic, where we have non-well-founded negation, that is self-negation, in various successive shapes as the basic log logical operation. And to end things off with a platonic question, is the good inherently good in itself or good because of the appropriate consequences? How would Hegel's philosophy respond to this? <clears throat> Hegel is not particularly enthusiastic about dualisms, as we all know, yeah. such as that of Platonism or Kantianism on the one hand and consequentialism on the other. I think he would diagnose this particular one as a variant of the untenable du logical dualism of inner and outer, which in the logic is sublated in the evolutionary state of logical space that Hegel labels actuality, Wirklichkeit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that sense, the good is not the good unless it's actualized yeah. and yeah. performed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A good poet is uh, not a person who uh, makes splendid poems in his imagination and discursive thinking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. no, he writes them down and he publishes them yeah, so that exactly, other people yeah. read and people yeah. talk about. Or writes them down at least. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe others will publish them when he's died. He has died. Yeah. As with Hölderlin, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Professor. This has been a very interesting and exciting discussion. Yeah, it was nice to talk with you and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity.